All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andrea McKenzie, who is just up the coast in Marina del Rey. How are you doing, Andrea? I'm doing great, John. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, of course. And Andrea is from Lead with Harmony, and she is an expert in conscious leadership. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about conscious leadership. So, Andrea, let's let's you know dive straight into it and uh, give us a good definition of what conscious leadership entails. Sure. So the first piece of it, first caveat, first disclaimer is that in this context, every single person is a leader. And the idea is that conscious leadership is about being self-aware, being aware of the people around you, uh, doing things with purpose, um, being receptive to the people around you. And when you have judgments going on in your head to stop and reanalyze before you immediately act on anything that's uh, destructive in any way. Uh, uh, and and let's face it, I mean, self-awareness is not that easy a thing to come by. It's not like you just sort of say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to become self-aware today. Right. It's it's a process. So how do you how do you help people start that process? Because I do believe it, it it's it's life changing, to be honest. I mean, when you go through a, a, a process process of, of self-awareness. Um, some of us, like me, maybe it took a little bit longer than it should have, but um, uh, so how do you help people so they get to self-awareness early in their career or life than many of us do? Sure. Well, I think something you kind of implied there too is, is people have to be willing to look at themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't really help somebody unless they're ready to help themselves. But I think when somebody is ready and they really want to find that thing that that drives them and they really want to be somebody who supports the people around them and lead with purpose and consciousness, um, the way to do it is with really powerful questions and assessments that help people pinpoint what's going on and and to be open to that. Right. It's the person has to be receptive to that on the other end. Yeah, because unfortunately, it often comes. Uh, there's often there's often a an event maybe that precipitates it, or a number of events, or whatever, or a period in your life. But I do think one thing, if there was any silver lining, maybe to the pandemic, was maybe for the first first time, a lot of people ha had time with themselves, and maybe you know, spending time with yourself, um, maybe that has opened up the opportunity to reevaluate everything. Oh, I think it was a great opportunity. I mean, yeah, while some people ended up being unconscious, like, you know, having mm -hmm. having the opposite yeah. happen and, and live in sort of fear, um, mm -hmm. the opposite happened too, which is people started to see the truth of like, wait a minute, I don't need to be, you know, going on rewind every day like a robot. There's other things mm -hmm. I care about. There's other things that I do. People started spending time that they didn't normally spend with their families. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, in some cases they found out they really loved being around them <laughs> in other places they didn't. But yes, we had a journey inward. It was almost like a mm -hmm. forced inward journey. And I think it opened up a lot of really great things for some people. Yeah. And then what you said about the, the conscious leadership part is that first the conscious part, but um, actually being aware. And that is something, again, I think that we live in this strange culture where we're bombarded all the time. Like we've got our phone going off. We've got text coming in. We've got social media. We've got news. We've got so many things that it's very, very easy for us not to be aware, not to be in the moment, not to be conscious. So it's, it's an active choice. Yeah. Oh, this is such a good thing that you brought up because we're bombarded with a lot of unconsciousness. We're bombarded with a lot of fear. We're bombarded with mm -hmm. things that are going to make us click and buy and react, right? To that mm -hmm. point about making judgments and sort of reacting to them. And I think slowing down and, and shutting the noise out and really listening to the voices inside yourself, that's the truth. The fear is not the truth. The fear is not consciousness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think it's not just that part too, but it's also the part of we live in such a reactive world. Like people are so used to reacting like immediately, 
Yeah, and and that's another thing to slow down. But you're almost going against, uh, you're almost counterculture when you start to say, hang on, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to be conscious and deliberate about what I do. Um, but on the upside of that is that uh, it gives you an opportunity to stand out. Yeah, well, I mean, I think also the, the same point about the pandemic, it made everybody slow down. And I think that's part mm -hmm. of what happened. And um, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, slow down. <laughs> Such a good, be, be conscious of what you're listening to, who you're listening to, how it's making you feel. You don't have to feel uh, all of these things. And I think there's a little bit of a misnomer that like being informed somehow makes you like, means you're being active in some way, shape or form. And you're not, you're just consuming information that's then changing your energy away from a lot of times where you really want to be and the purpose you really want to um, follow. Yeah. No, because I mean, I would say if, uh, you know, if there's a meteor headed towards your neighborhood, one of your neighbors will probably let you know. So the fact is that a lot of the stuff like that's the news and all of this stuff going on every day, it really has zero impact on your life. So if you're choosing to invite, as you said, your inputs, if you're choosing to invite all of that stuff in every day or maybe starting your day, with it you're not setting yourself up you're setting yourself up to be active which is the opposite of being conscious yeah oh yeah i mean it's very easy to have that sort of like shiny object syndrome <laughs> and you can do it with things that look look fun and and happy and things that look scary and you know to run away from things so mm -hmm. yeah i mean getting getting clear in your mind about what it is you really want the path you really want to take the direction you want to go in i think is um, it's to your point earlier, it's not easy, um, mm -hmm. but it's simple. When you do it, it becomes very simple and clear. And then what are the other parts of conscious leadership? Because you once mentioned, you know, receptivity, right? So, I mean, if you're aware to begin with, then one thing is being aware. Another thing is being receptive. And that, again, is an active. It's, 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 it's something that's an active choice, right? Oh, gosh, yeah. Receptivity is... Um, it's a practice, just like something like gratitude is, you know, um, being able to receive what's coming at you and process it, being able to read between the lines, being able to um, accept help, being able to, I mean, there's just being able to receive as its own um, gracious act. <laughs> um, and, and it allows you to be, be reciprocal and, and have, you know, really great um, amplified generosity amongst people, especially on teams um, within organizations. Yeah, you know, that's a fascinating one that you just raised there, that idea of being receptive to help and to input from others. But receptive to help is is something I think that's a, that's a key point, because again, if you take it, the pervasive culture work culture not just in corporate america but you know it's kind of spread across the world now but it's when you go into a position or you're hired for something you immediately think oh my goodness i'm supposed to know everything i'm supposed to be the expert in this so people uh close themselves off and are not receptive to help because they feel somehow yeah they might actually welcome the help but they fear that it might they might be perceived as not being able to do their job yeah, that it's a weakness of some kind. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. We all need help. <laughs> we all need help. We all, you know, there's this thing of, you know, especially in small business where everybody wears every hat and no, there's only certain hats that really fit certain people. And so getting to, to know each other and being able to collaborate in ways where people are bringing their best always and that they're okay in their in a safe space to say i don't i don't know this <laughs> i don't do this <laughs> let's figure out how we can get there because hiding that is only going to make you worse off in the end mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i haven't said that I, i've over the years i come to when I come across real experts and stuff is my trust level in them goes way up when I ask them something and they say, mm, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. Um, maybe here's a resource you could go. But but the fact that they're willing to say, no, I don't know anything about that for me actually raises my trust level in them rather than diminishes it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. 
I think that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. go no, I think that being able to say I don't know is is huge. I think it's. Yeah. Yeah, it's the truth. But to your point, do you, yeah, but to your point, then obviously you have to create an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to raise things, it's okay to be wrong about things. Mm -hmm. Something and you say, okay, well, we did that, we tried it, didn't work. At least now we know it doesn't work. And then you move on yeah. as opposed to, oh, we wasted all this time and all of this and stuff. Say, no, we learned something about it. To, to flip it around and say, mistakes are something we should share and we should mm -hmm. cherish. Um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was Sarah Blakely had, was talking about how she was doing um, uh, at Spank, she was doing meetings around like people talking about their greatest mistakes and it brought out mm -hmm. so many great, I mean, I was, I loved that. It was amazing. Um, yeah, let's share our mistakes. That's how progress happens. That's how new ideas come about. Mistakes are not a bad thing. Absolutely not. No, no, not not at all. And then how how is it? Uh, you know, when you talked about the concept of leadership, but self leadership first, and leadership of others, you know, second. And um, how do you how do you uh, help people understand what leadership means from a personal point of view, like self leadership, like leading despite not having a, the title or, or whatever, but being being able and having the confidence uh, you know, to be the leader that you want to be. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all seen examples of people who are seemingly powerless, who mm -hmm. stand up for something they believe in and change the world, or at least change their neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> um, so knowing what you really stand for, what you value and, and being unwavering in that, the things that you know you're here to, to represent. And um, I think it does. It takes a lot of digging um internally it takes a lot of openness it's not uh, it's there's there's it's scary a little bit you know to to stick up for what you believe in but that's what it is in the end yeah but to even get to that point is you have to believe in something right you have to mm. understand what what are your you know what are your values what are your principles what what are the what are those red lines that you would even set for yourself like this is something that i wouldn't step over or this is my value this is, but you have to actually and i do feel like a lot of people never really discover what those are yeah faith belief all of that right those are the mm -hmm. things that we don't necessarily equate a lot of times with career and business and all of these things but uh, as a coach, we work a lot on beliefs and limiting beliefs and things like that. And I, I'm here to tell you that if you're one of those people who says you don't believe in anything or you don't have a faith, that is a faith and a belief within itself that you are going to be fighting for the rest of your life. <laughs> so you got to pick something. If you pick nothing, that's what you that's what you picked. Um, and it's probably not going to serve you as much as as digging in and really understanding where your belief system is coming from and and turning it around, choosing what you you know what you superimpose and the meaning of things on life is basically what creates a really great mindset mm -hmm. and you mentioned something interesting there is like understanding where your belief system comes from because i do think that's another that's another great issue it's funny how you know people can be highly successful they can seem very confident but there are things from way, maybe from way back in their childhood that they're unconscious of that will trigger them and have them uh, it happens to all of us and have them act in an odd manner because something so removed has triggered something. Oh, yeah. So many very seemingly successful, rich, wealthy people are falling apart inside. Absolutely. And a lot of it is unconscious. It, it is subconscious, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think picking apart what is conscious for you and and how you're behaving is where you you start to dig into what's going on underneath it all um it's intense work <laughs> it's not yeah. something you do overnight even you said it right you wish you could do it earlier in life i think it's mm -hmm. it's part of a rite of passage to start to un, unfold all of that as you as you get older and as you really see yeah. how your belief system is serving you or not yeah, yeah. Well, as they say, wisdom wisdom is wasted on the young, isn't it? So, um, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, so here's, here's another part of this is just just what you mentioned there is is the the work involved but um oftentimes there's also mind body connections isn't it like how you feel and how you think affects how you feel as well uh you know how you feel physically and i think people often overlook or ignore that because we've grown up in a culture where um let's face it mind and body is separated you go to your 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 go to your general practitioner if you've got a pain you go to a psychiatrist if you're depressed whatever but the connect but rarely do they all work together seamlessly because we're not we're not actually we're not told that or we're, that isn't promoted the mind body connection but i do think that in these situations like you're talking about now um you will have physical reactions one way or the other as well absolutely I mean, I, I, this is one that I wish I had had more understanding of as a young person was that my feelings were being carried in my body. And, and mm -hmm. yes, I mean, we all know when we're stressed out and all of a sudden our neck or, you know, back or whatever, you know, it, of course it's, it's connected. There's no, no way it's not. Um, we create a lot of ailments in our lives. And, and then the worst part about it is then the ailment happens and then we get even into further victim energy around this happened to me mm -hmm. rather than the right. responsibility of actually go back into your mind and see, <laughs> see where, <laughs> where you may have created some of it. You know, that's, it's tough. It's, it's an, it's a tough concept sometimes to, to talk about because people don't necessarily want to take responsibility. I know I haven't at times in my life, so I'm <laughs> calling myself out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, we've all we've all been there. We've all been there. Let's face it, sometimes it's much easier to ignore these things. But but the fact is, um, it, it's a good thing to start to be conscious about is how do you feel physically when you're in work or at work, even if you're in your work remotely or whatever? How do you physically feel when you're working? Yeah. I mean, people are plagued with all kinds of things, you know, headaches, stomach aches, you know, like back aches, neck aches, and they just let them again, very unconsciously let them fester and fester and your body keeps talking to you and talking, <laughs> trying to tell you something, right? It's like, hey, you're stressed out, you know, go do something, move me a little bit, you know, and, and we just ignore it. Like we can white knuckle our way through it and uh, your body's trying to tell you something, listen to it. Yeah. And I mean, that's where you should really start to be opening up to the help of others. Uh, and because here's the other part, uh, yeah, Andrea, is that, you know, the self-leadership part, but often when people are in leadership positions, like that's the part that's really hard for them. As we said earlier, it's really hard to reach out and ask for help. Um, instead of looking at it as your job is to find people who are good at things, right? That's part of what your job is to find the right people to do the right things. It's not to do everything yourself. Mm hmm. Yes. Finding the right people to do the things. And um, a lot of times we find the wrong people and then our job becomes even bigger and we would have been better off not hiring anyone at all. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And, and I think, too, when it comes back to the, the stress and the self-care and all of that, I think leaders who model that in their uh in their workplaces it's also a big thing and reward you know don't reward people for working all weekend or don't punish mm -hmm. people for leaving early because they have to take care of something you know there's there's lots of ways that we can extend that value system out to team members and people around us yeah no ab absolutely i mean one of the simplest ways is just you know being just performance you know it's it's great if you've got a good got good performance metrics and things like that then you can and people take that accountability for themselves then you can be a lot more flexible with their with their working arrangement so it all comes down to i think is is when uh is when people are accountable as you said and when they're aware and, and when they're just uh, transparent and open and honest yeah, honesty. I don't know. <laughs> like we said, I don't have the answer. Just gonna tell you. Yeah. I'll find out, <laughs> or I'll get somebody. Exactly. Said. Exactly. Or you say, "Listen, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I work from home now, but I, I need this hour to collect the kids or whatever. I need this hour, so I'll work late." But, but just being upfront and having those conversations, I think those are trust building because, you know, unfortunately, we have, we have, you know, humans. We're such a weird, weird people um that we love to fixate on like ooh, is that person they're working remote now 
I bet you they're not working as hard. I bet you not they're not doing as much. I bet you they're mucking about or whatever. Instead of just going, no, well, let's look at the work. Let's talk. Let's have an honest dialogue. And let's see, like, do we need a slightly different arrangement now that they're there? Do we need different hours? Whatever. But but not allowing ourselves, you know, be, having these open two-way dialogues rather than allowing ourselves imagine things. Oh, yeah. And I, and this is a big one right now is, you know, some, they can work elsewhere and do nothing, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, we don't, I think what's interesting is that there's this perception that when people are working from home, they're not working, but if they're getting mm -hmm. the same job done, then they're yeah. probably doing what they were doing in the office. Now, do you know if they were working when they were in the office? Do you have any not. way of proving no. that? <laughs> you no, know, I exactly. mean, that's always the question I come back at is like, if the job is getting done and you think they're not doing anything from home, then they must not have been doing very much in the office and you weren't really <laughs> looking at that either. The only thing you cared about mm. is that they were there and you could see them, you know, exactly. so there's, there's an intrinsic, there's like a systemic problem going yeah. on across all of this where we have no way of measuring what anyone's doing anyway. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, listen, Andrew, this has been fascinating. All of Andrew's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. Uh, my business is called Lead with Harmony. I help business owners and executives with hiring strategically, leading and developing teams for stronger leadership, <laughs> uh, higher productivity, lower stress, all of that good stuff. I, I love working with leaders who are all about creating great workplaces and uh, advocate, advocate for the, the well-being of the people that they, that they work with and they hire. Yeah, that was some fantastic. Thanks again, Andrea. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you all again soon.